welcome everyone. We're just letting everyone get in from the Zoom waiting room. We'll start in about 30 seconds. All right. Welcome to all of our attendees to this Linux Foundation Energy webinar on carbon data specification, mechanisms to improve data access and standardization in the electricity sector. We are privileged to have with us a great panel of presenters for you today. We're going to go into more detail about this topic. If you have any questions, we would love to respond to those. The way to do that is in your Zoom interface, there is a button that says Q&A. You can submit questions at any time. And when we get to the Q&A section at the end of the webinar, we will go ahead and answer those in the order that they were received. So please don't hesitate to wait. Um, you can submit your questions again using that Q&A tool at any time. With that, I'm going to turn things over to LF Energy Executive Director Alex Thornton to kick us off. All right, thanks, Dan. Can you move ahead to uh, next few slides, please? All right. So, uh, as Dan said, I I'm Alex Thornton, Executive Director at LF Energy. And I'm just going to be setting the context for the rest of the webinar about the importance of open standards, specifically for the energy sector. So next slide, Dan. Uh, briefly to introduce LF Energy. So we accelerate the energy transition by building communities to develop open technologies and standards. If you go to the next slide, what that means in practice is we provide a, a host of supporting services that ensure that large thriving sustainable ecosystems develop around open source projects. So I won't go through all of those services here, but one of those is webinars such as this one to build up communities and get the word out. Next slide. We are a uh, member funded nonprofit foundation uh, and I'm fortunate to be joined by some of our members here as co-presenters today. So in the next slide, let's get to standards. So, I think everybody uh, attending today would recognize this. This is your standard American electrical outlet. And most of us don't think about it at all day to day, which is actually why it's so amazing. It is literally plug and play, right? Maybe the first plug and play thing where you can take any electrical device in, in the US, plug it in there, and you are confident that you are going to get the power you need and it's going to be safe. And that's an amazing, amazing impact. And that's all facilitated by agreement and alignment of standards. And if you go to the next slide, what standards really facilitate is interoperability and safety. And you see on the right side, what happens when we don't necessarily have international alignment around standards. We have just uh, you know, all different types of plugs. Anybody who's traveled internationally knows you oftentimes need to bring a, a plug adapter with you. And it's annoying and it's challenging and sometimes it can be really hard to get the electricity that you need. Uh, and so this just kind of makes concrete why standards actually make our world go around and why they're important. And without consistent international standards, interoperability and scalability are really hard. So in the next slide, <clears throat> we talk about the electric grid. It's the largest and most complex machine ever made. It's really a system of systems. So be think Alex may have frozen. <laughs> So let's give him just a few seconds. And if not, then we will go on to the next section and we can come back to him when he's back. Skip ahead since we've lost Alex. 
unless someone else wanted to uh, set the stage with his slides, um, then I think we'll move on to Ali. That sounds good. I don't think I would have done as good a job at his slides. <laughs> so we'll, let, we'll wait for him to come back for those. All right. Well, it's good to, to be here with you all. I'm Hallie Kramer. I am a technical program manager at Google on our climate operations team. And I'm here today to speak very briefly about why Google got involved in this project. We've been part of this project since its inception in the beginning, and we're really excited to see the, the recent progress of the project. Uh, and so if you go to the next slide, to set the context of, of why Google got involved, I wanted to start with our energy journey. So in 2007, Google uh, was one of the first companies to be carbon neutral, compensating our operational emissions with carbon offsets. Then in 2010, we had our first power purchase agreement working towards a goal of 100% renewable energy uh, that we first achieved in 2017. And then in 2020, we set and announced a, our most recent moonshot goal to achieve 24 seven carbon free energy by 2030. And I like this graphic of these goals because there are a couple of things I wanna call out here. The first is that each goal is getting more ambitious and you can see very clearly that our, our last goal, the one that we're working towards for 2030, it's the steepest part of the mountain yet that we've yet to fully climb. The second part that I wanna call out here is that the path is not always straight. There are some switchbacks, there might be some setbacks and we're making progress, but it might not always look linear uh, as we move towards those goals. And then lastly, even though this isn't super clear as part of this slide, but we want to do this together. We don't think that this is something that Google will be able to accomplish alone. We need other energy buyers. We need market solutions. We need open source standards. We need a lot of industry collaboration to make this feasible uh, across the, the industry. Next slide, please. In terms of our latest goal on 24-7 carbon free energy, what happened was we hit the 100% renewable energy goal and we realized that we hadn't done enough if you look at this graphic here, the, the black bars are a flat data center load that we're assuming in this case across the year. And then the green is a, a, let's say a typical wind profile. And if you sum this up across the year, we can get 100% matching. But if you have the data to look more granularly on an hourly basis for a given location, you can see that there are still a number of gaps in carbon-free energy where Google is relying on the grid and on fossil fuels to serve our load. You also see that there are times of excess carbon-free energy. So what our 24 seven carbon-free energy goal does is it takes this into account by looking at this more granular data and it aligns our needs with the needs of the grid by thinking about how do we smooth out this curve? How do we better meet our load with an expanded solution set that thinks about diversifying clean energy portfolios, demand side flexibility, or other things that can support reliability on the grid as well. So overall, it's better aligning our needs with the needs of the grid. Next slide, please. And what you can see from that prior slide is that you need granular data and there's an important role for data to play here. When we got became interested in the Carbon Data Specification Consortium, there are a number of key use cases that we found really interesting and relevant for Google as well. The first, granular carbon accounting. This is thinking about uh, how do we ensure that our carbon inventories are both reliable and credible. And one way to do that is to moving to more granular carbon accounting, location-based and um, temporal-based matching. The second is thinking about how do we use data to inform long-term decision-making, our next generation procurement. This relates back to diversifying our, our clean energy portfolio, maybe even thinking on the energy efficiency side and other decarbonization projects that are longer-term projects that need access to understand the, the grid and how it operates on a granular basis. Third is how do we potentially use data to inform near real-time decision-making. So thinking about grid flexibility, demand response, load shifting that can support the grid needs 
in a shorter uh, time frame. And lastly, we think about grid planning. How do we use better data to bolster tool development and improve modeling so that we can prepare for a clean energy transition that we need? Next slide, please. So uh, closing out the, this part of how do, what does it mean when we say better data? What is better data in the context of what the carbon data specification is creating? Well, the carbon data specification is creating standards and specifications that can allow us to get data that is scalable, granular, reliable, secure, standardized, and timely. And these are all really important elements to serve those use cases that I outlined on the prior slide. And as a global company that operates in multiple regions across the US, across the globe, standardization plays a really important role in our ability to scale and getting access to our data from our, uh, from our data centers, from our offices, from our contracted renewable energy, contact, contracted clean energy, and also from understanding the grids that we are operating on. And so this is why uh, it's really important, the work that's being done here and, and the the value that we see in it. Next slide. This is my last slide. And I just wanted to call out, if you're interested in learning more about Google's interest in standardization and in uh, providing more data transparency in the energy sector, would encourage you to scan the code here and read more in our white paper that was released last April because what I'll leave you with from Google's side is that we think better data is the foundational building block that needs to, to develop solutions that are needed for any clean energy future. And I will pass it now to Daniel to talk more about the specifications themselves. We actually have Alex back. So oh, we'll go if back that's okay, we'll, we'll jump back to uh, where he left off. Yeah, sorry about the hiccup, everybody. Think we Sometimes were here. things don't go as planned. Yep, we were there. All right. So yeah, I was talking about the electric grid system of systems needs standards to interrupt technically uh, as well as economically. So I think, Dan, we can go to the next one. And there we go. All right, So so standards have been created traditionally for centuries now. Um, and generally, this is how it would work in order to create a standard. So you'd start with an idea, a problem that needed to be solved. And that idea would go into a standards body. And internally, there would be some sort of project approval process where a committee would review these ideas and say, yes, this is a problem that we need to address via standard. A working group would get spun up and they would develop a draft standard. And again, all of this is happening internally to that standards body. And eventually that standard, that draft gets passed for approval. And it's important to understand that this, this process is deliberately consensus driven, relatively slow, and that's on purpose. And really what it's trying to optimize for is comfort with the standards and adoption of those standards, right? And so it goes through this consensus driven approach, eventually gets approved. And at that point, then that standard is published externally so that stakeholders outside of the standard process can view it and use it. And what gets published is a document. And that document in order to become useful technology needs to get interpreted, implemented, and then different organizations can layer on their own competitive strategic innovation on top of it. And so it's important to recognize this approach has worked really, really well. Uh, especially for relatively stable hardware ecosystems, right? So the grid historically has been a set of physical infrastructure. Looking at that electrical outlet, that's a standard that has stood the test of time. It's really not changing. The laws of physics and electricity aren't changing. And so it's important for this process to be deliberate because it, all of the resulting standards need to last for decades to come. Now, Dan, if you go to the next slide. Things are changing. We're in the midst of an intense energy transition where the pace of change is accelerating. We have physical infrastructure, but that physical infrastructure is being optimized now by digital solutions. We can't build fast enough, and so therefore we need, need to use a digital layer to optimize the built environment. 
And the pace of change in digital is much faster than the physical world. So we have this traditional standards process, which worked really well for physical infrastructure, but maybe isn't the best fit as we pursue digital solutions. It can't necessarily keep up with the pace of change. And also we have different types of expertise that are required uh, that we need to get access to and, and a closed process sometimes doesn't facilitate that. So that's where open standards come in. They're fast, agile, they facilitate widespread contribution and adoption. And most importantly, they can meet the pace demanded of the digital energy transition. So let's talk about what those look like in practice. Next slide, please. So open standards are very much a complement to the traditional standards process. So you, again, you start with an idea and instead of going through this standards-based project approval process, you take it to a community specification, which any group of organizations can, can pursue. It's low friction. You start putting together the specification that you think solves the problem space that you've defined. And with that specification in hand, you can build industry adoption. That industry adoption really is support turning that specification into a de facto standard. And that can then be submitted to that traditional standards process and become formalized as an internationally accepted formal standard. So the result is very much similar, but the benefit is you, you get significantly increased speed and agility through that community specification industry adoption process. You get to iterate more quickly and make sure things that are working as expected. And then on the other side, once the standard is published, you can extend that collaboration scope so that you're creating reference implementations and interpretation so you don't have different flavors of a digital standard and you have consistent approach to the implementation. So you really reduce the amount of duplication of effort there. And then organizations can focus very much on that competitive layer where they wanna strategically innovate. Next slide, please. So just because a standard is open doesn't mean that it's a free for all. There is a project charter that defines the scope for collaboration, legal structure, governance model. There's a license that determines how the specification can be used. And then a defined governance framework provides long-term structured decision-making. So anybody can see what's happening with the specification, but not anybody can make decisions around the specification. The governance framework determines that. Next slide. And the Linux Foundation is here to help. So we have tools to make setting up well-structured standards projects easier. I mentioned community specifications. So really that's just a template that anybody can use, make a copy of, and then change some fields so that you can get started creating a community specification quickly. Or if you want something a little bit more robust, we have uh, an entity called the Joint Development Foundation, which can set up a, a specific nonprofit legal entity to house this collaboration effort. Uh, we also work really well with existing standards bodies. We're an approved submitter to ISO with success in submitting standards to them. And we're also a formal partner of Etsy. Next slide. So in conclusion, standards are important. They ensure technical and economic systems function and thrive. Open standards are fast, agile, and transparent. They meet the pace required of the energy transition. Open standards are not a free-for-all. They have clearly defined governance structures and the Linux Foundation can help. We have success partnering with standards bodies such as ISO and Etsy. And that's all I've got. So I think now it's on to Daniel. Thank you very much, Alex. I, um, I will be presenting, I'm Daniel Ressler. I'm the Founder and Chief Technology Officer at Utility API. I am also the maintainer of Working Group One, which focuses on connectivity and customer data access for, uh, for users to request and download utility data, um, specifically customer data from utilities. So I'm gonna give a tour of the specifications that we are working on as part of that working group. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background, um, the idea behind why these specifications exist and the benefits of them. Um, and then I'm going to um, hand it over to Henry for the other working group specifications. So uh, we can go to the next slide. So one of the main issues that um, Hallie mentioned before um, is that 
scaling up the adoption of clean energy technologies, including energy efficiency, electric vehicles, uh, uh, building electrification, distributed generation, load management technologies. These are all um, necessary in order to make the energy transition happen. And when we take a look at the, the way that those existing technologies are deployed, um, it's very manual. If you have a project that you are trying to do to do uh, building electrification or something like that, um, in general, you have a project developer or somebody working on it, but it's a one-off sort of situation. And so it, it's a very manual. They have to get the data. They have to do the calculations. They have to do all of that sort of stuff. And so um, the kind of general understanding is that while the technologies exist, they're all one-off sort of, or a significant portion of them are one-offs. And so, uh, and a lot of that is the data access part and the data connectivity part. Getting integrated into a system is a one-off manual process. And, and so we start off with the assumption that like getting data and connecting with systems once is easy in the sense that it's straightforward. You can do it if you devote time to it. It's kind of clunky, but you can do it. However, getting data and connectivity at scale, that is the hard part. How do you do millions of these things in order for the energy transition to, to be successful? And so the scaling of that data access and connectivity is the focus of these specifications and the reason why we're trying to like basically have an open standard for it so that platforms, DERs, all of the users of these systems, as well as the centralized utilities, um, distribution companies, ISOs, all of that DTOs, they are all able to scale up the amount of connectivity and data transfer um, that the energy transition needs. And so that's the focus of these. Next slide, please. Um, so let's dive into a little bit more of the specifics of what getting utility customer data, why that's, why that's so difficult. Um, nowadays, you, the, um, the amount of data that you need is quite complex. You need interval data, 15 minutes, 35,000 data points a year. Um, it's no longer just like walking over to the filing cabinet and, and pulling out the bills and typing them in. Um, most customers are not very energy savvy, so they don't know what data is what. A lot of customers that you're you're dealing with as a, as a vendor trying to deploy a clean energy technology is like they don't know what a kilowatt hour is and they don't have to think about it. They don't think about it much. So um, that's a big barrier right there uh, if you're trying to get them to do things and participate in this. Um, individual customer data has a lot of privacy restrictions on it, rightly so, um, both in North America and Europe. Um, there are a lot of stand or a lot of requirements um, at the both the local and national levels um, around being able to get access to private customer um, data. Uh, it's also the system is very fragmented. The energy system is very fragmented. There are many, many different utilities. There are many different regions. There are many different grids. And they all kind of operate and have their own way of doing things. And so if you are a for example, an electric vehicle manufacturer or a national technology or an international technology company like Google, you have to basically figure out how to deal with each one of those regions and each one of those different fragments. And that's very cumbersome. Um, data formats are very ad hoc um, frequently uh, for, for the sort of data that you need, or the data format is proprietary. You have to buy access to some sort of specification for it. So that's a, that's a barrier. Um, and it's also very hard to discover what utilities offer what, because frequently utilities will tell their commission or tell their regulatory authority that they have implemented a thing, but there's no actual page on the website to go find that, or you have to click around on each individual utility website in order to figure out what they offer. That's a, another barrier. Um, a lot of utilities, especially things like small municipal water utilities, they don't even have an online access ability. And for those who do have access, being able to get onboarded is that system of one-off, 
it's a very manual, cumbersome process. And so figuring out a way to scale that up is, an, is a goal here. Um, as existing and uh, standards and regulatory oversight is quite complex. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff mixed up in that. And so our goal with the open standards, as Alex was saying, is to emphasize the openness and ability for people to you know, get, get up to speed on it um, at, their own, uh, at their own time. We can go on to the next slide. So let's, uh, let's talk about like how we logically split up the specifications for solving these problems of gaining data access. So there, the first set, category specifications, focuses on connectivity. And um, if we go to the next slide, and the first component is discovery. Um, so discovery is a how a user, so say a business or a vendor who has some sort of electrification technology or grid flexibility technology, how do they figure out who offers connectivity? And that is, uh, that is the focus. Uh, so discovery is kind of the name for that, that sort of uh, question is how do you discover what utilities, what centralized operators are, um, are, are offering what sort of capabilities? Because since the system is so fragmented, um, things uh, come online at different times and you have to be able to automate the process of discovering when things come online and when capabilities start getting offered by which fragment. Uh, next. Uh, the next uh, category is Registration and connectivity. So that's the concept of once you know that this utility is offering um, some sort of capability, some sort of data access or some sort of power systems access, um, how do you actually register with that utility or connect with that utility, establish a secure token exchange, um, establish a, sure, um, a secure uh, communications thing, jump through all of the uh, uh, requirements like so registration requirements, reporting requirements, if there's some sort of fee associated with, uh, with that sort of access, being able to automate that process as well because the system is so fragmented is a core focus of this. And so we can go to the next one. Um, we have created two specifications. The first one is called server metadata. And that is, uh, that is focused on the dis solving the discovery problem of scaling up um, data access at, uh, between distributed entities and utilities. And then the second specification is called client registration. And so these are the two specifications that we have created for uh, addressing the connectivity or the discovery and the connectivity um, issues for, for getting things working and connected within the ecosystem. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So this is, uh, these are the descriptions of the two uh, first two connectivity specifications um, that I kind of lumped together. Um, the second specification client registration actually depends on the server metadata because you won't figure out how to register at a utility unless you discover what the endpoints are for that utility. So they kind of are, are tied together. Um, and we can go to the next slide. These are kind of uh, screenshots of the overview, and there are links in the slides as well uh, to the drafts of those. So these are currently in draft form. Um, there is a open pull request on the um, GitHub repository for these um, two specifications, and we are currently reviewing comments and going through comments and updating. I'm you know, I'm, I'm in the process of providing basically a second version of the drafts for these based on comments that have made by the working group so far. So um, it's, uh, I encourage everybody to go check them out and, and read through them and provide comments on the, on the pull requests as um, this is an open standard. Everything is happening kind of in the open. So it's anybody can go and review things and comment on things. Um, and that's all, and that's all uh, described on the working group website. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So who can benefit from these specifications? And the answer is, in the next slide, other specifications. So this is a the audience for these specifications are other 
specifications and protocols that have an existing set of guidelines for connectivity. So if you are, for example, a virtual power plant protocol or a DER market thing, um, we're, we're giving a talk actually next month um, at the uh, FERC conference around real-time data sharing and, and bootstrapping those connections is a topic that needs discussion because currently the ecosystem is all one-off sort of registration, getting things onboarded. It take month, takes months to happen. And these specifications potentially are a solution for those issues, not only with customer data access, but power systems data access, but market participation access. These are all generic uh, these first two specifications are generic to streamline third-party service provider registration and onboarding. Um, for example, the reason why these were created was because we had a need for that for the customer data working group to write a specification for the customer data access. And so that's what we're focused on here. Um, and so we are, uh, so for example, the customer data specification uses these first two connectivity specifications as the basis for bootstrapping that connection and then defines a protocol by which you can access customer data. So that's, uh, that's pretty important to know. And so un by unblocking service provider registration and onboarding, we accelerate the adoption of new innovative programs, grid flexibility and deployment of clean energy technology. So that's kind of the summary of the connectivity specifications. You can go to the next slide. So now I'm going to turn to the customer data specifications. And so this is the specification that describes the protocol by which you can request and download customer utility or system data at a centralized utility or other centralized entity. So it could be a um, uh, some sort of ISO or something like that. Um, so going back to the original uh, kind of like, how do we parse out these categories of problems? Um, discovery and registration and connectivity are, are, are addressed by the connectivity specifications. But then the next requirement for a scale or component of a scalable customer data access system is authorization. As I mentioned before, this customer data is private information. You need customer consent. Um, or approval in order to get access to it. And so that's a very important part to define in, some, in a scalable uh, system. And then the next part is the actual data protocols themselves, the formats of data, what, how you access it, um, the API definitions, that sort of thing. And so focusing on that as well. And these are defined as part of the third specification. We can go to the next one which is called the customer data specification. So that's what the working group is named after, um, but it focuses on the defining how to get customer consent and authorization in order to access customer data because you need individual customer consent in, in most cases. Uh, and then also what is the data formats and protocols for accessing that data, um, the API endpoints, that sort of thing for, for getting that. So we can go to the next slide. So this is the, the probably going to be the biggest of the specifications. We also have a draft for that um, available. It's a little bit, um, it's less, it's, um, it, it's got more work on it than the other two specifications, um, but it's, a, it's kind of an all encompassing thing for many, many different use cases. The working group defined four different target use cases at the beginning in order to like basically keep things focused for this uh, for this specification, um, the first use case is carbon accounting. So that's going to be your platforms or your teams within enterprise companies who are doing the carbon accounting calculations. The, is this the, is the data that is being provided by a utility in this standard adequate for their needs to do their goals of carbon accounting? The second target use case is decarbonization projects. 
So that's going to be once you actually do your carbon accounting and once you actually are looking to manage your carbon better, um, you generally want to engage with vendors who can help you out. And so that's going to be your building electrification companies, your electric vehicle companies, your um, distributed uh, energy resource companies, distributed generation, energy efficiency, market participation, like virtual power plants. These are all companies that you would want to uh, engage with and to do decarbonization projects. And so those companies making sure that they get their needs met um, for uh, customer data access is a target use case that we have as well. Um, thirdly, uh, this the concept of a flexible grid um, for when um, generation uh, renewable generation is intermittent or or needs to be flexible. The grid needs to be flexible. Um, there are increasing numbers of programs and markets and uh, initiatives that are focused on driving that grid flexibility and communication. And so the use cases for those vendors and those technologies that are doing um, that sort of stuff and getting that set up is a goal of this, of, this, uh, of this specification and working group. And then lastly, um, going beyond just the individual company level and into the municipal or regional level, um, what we are seeing in the United States very frequently is that a city will want to know um, a, uh, an overview of how efficient are all the buildings. And so think of that as like a regional or municipal level carbon accounting. And so that goes beyond just an individual customer like a, a Google and into a region um, or a state. So for example, in Colorado, it's there is a statewide mandate for building benchmarking to measure and benchmark the energy efficiency of all of the buildings um, over a certain square footage in Colorado. And, and that requires customer data access as well, aggregated at a certain level or with the consent of the individual tenants within that building. And so that is a frequent um, kind of like step up in the carbon accounting space that we also want to address as part of this working group and make sure the customer data specification meets the needs of that use case as well. So those are the four overall use cases. Some use cases that are not included in the scope of this specification are things like real-time grid management. So uh, real-time operations, so things like solar curtailment or um, or turning you know, demand response on and off, that sort of thing. This is not a real-time um, control specification. This is a, hey, you need data to do your analytics. It's kind of a, you know, a, an accounting <laughs> specification, which is, which, is the main, which is the main focus of this. So that's a little bit of overview of the specifications for this particular working group. You can go to the next slide. So uh, to conclude for this working group, of course, I'm going to ask for, you know, if you're interested in uh, getting involved, we have a website, it's customerdata.carbondataspec.org. Um, join the mailing list, join the mailing list, join the mailing list is the goal uh, for if you are interested in this. We uh, post pretty much everything, all of our meeting notifications, and if there's any sort of like pull request um, updates, major updates, um, we will, you know, disseminate those through the mailing list. So it's a very low volume mailing list. And so you don't necessarily have to worry about getting messages uh, every day, uh, but that is by far the best place to keep track of the goings on of the working group. We also have uh, regular meetings um, every other week. So twice a month and the next meeting is next Thursday at about this time. So um, if you are attending this meeting, you can potentially attend the, the working group calls as well. I'd encourage you to attend those as well. And um, everything is being done in the open. This is an open standards um, uh, JDF. And so we are, uh, we, we are encouraging the people at their own leisure to go through um, the GitHub repos and the website and comment and provide feedback. Everything is open source on the, on the GitHub repository. So that's a little bit of overview of getting involved in the working group. So I think that that is uh, turning it over to Henry for the power systems data uh, specifications.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Henry Richardson. I'm an analyst at Watt Time, but more importantly, I'm a member of the Power Systems Data Spec. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, um, I think just to give a brief overview of the intent of this working group, just like Alex and Hallie were talking about, like the importance of being able to access standardized information around the world about power systems is really the intent of this group. Whereas Daniel was talking about like how to identify uh, identify what information a grid operator provides and um, then being able to register and access that data. And then more specifically for customer data. So information about the assets that you own, that's the really focus of the customer data working group. The, the working, the focus of the power systems data group is really to focus on information about the whole entire system. And that's really to enable a bunch of use cases around carbon accounting, taking action based on that information about renewable siting, load flexibility. So, so the, the power systems data group is really focused on accessing information not about, not about individual assets that you own, but about the entire power system. And that can be a whole mix of different information, whether it's generation mix, imports and exports, total emissions on the system, um, if there are constraints or other things. And so it's a really focus on what does this entire system look like that the that you are that you are connected to um and so to really enable that we on the next slide we kind of define two key concepts one is topology levels so what is the like structure of the grid that you're connected to how is it organized what every grid operator kind of describes their electric grid differently so we kind of came up with a like a generic what is the topology of this grid that you're connected to and so that we use that kind of description of topology levels. And then power system resource is kind of like an encompassing term to describe. It can include everything from like the entire grid region as a power system resource or an individual power plant. So the grid operator can then identify subregions within their power system as a power system resource, and then identify individual power plants or substations within that subregion as power system resources. And then the to and how they relate relate to each other through the topology levels. Um, so we're really trying to come up with a a way of describing power systems through kind of a generic approach that can be adapted to the many different power systems we see around. And then on the next slide, we kind of organize this information into three broad categories. There's system level information that just describes like how the grid is organized, different. Uh, resources on that grid and then we included prices and i'll get into the importance of that like what type of prices are seen in this power market because many grids around the world use different ways of operating the wholesale market um and then we also have kind of static information or not static it it, it evolves more slowly so you have the topology of the grid you might add or change things slowly over time you can then just get information about the different uh, power system resources, the capacity in that either grid region or of that asset, um, as well as how those different power system resources are connected to each other through transmission. Th this kind of quote unquote static information evolves relatively slowly. Um, and so this is intended as a way of describing the power system overall. And then more dynamically, there's a whole set of time series information. So what were the emissions at a particular time? And can you get that information from the grid operator? And we've kind of cast a relatively wide net. So we want to know the, the emissions of the system, the generation on that system, demand, imports and exports, price and curtailment. So all of these different elements help describe a power system. Um, and once you have all of this kind of critical raw information about the grid, you can kind of build very important models on top of that around um, average emissions or marginal emissions or clean uh, clean energy fraction. So this is the, the intent of this information is to get the core information about the power system that enables all of the use cases that are so important for decarbonizing the grid, whether that's 24 by seven matching, emissionality, um, uh, location-based, like thinking about siting differently. So this is intended to kind of make transparent grid data around the world to enable individual actors to help decarbonize those grids. Because a lot of this information is locked down and behind 
um, very weird or non-existent APIs that are not available to the public. And so we've been kind of working to find this standard and it's available through our working group, but we have a kind of set of open questions on the next slide where we're looking for feedback. We have a draft standard, but there are some kind of open questions that we'd really like help kind of exploring. There's a, we've defined a way of uh, describing prices in the spec, but like, do, you, do we think it's robust? Does it cover all of the different cases we may encounter in the world? Um, what is the treatment of imports and exports effective? Like currently they're separately, they're broken out separately, but they could be combined as positive and negative. There's some advantages to having them combined and some advantages to separating. Um, and we also describe transmission th through the through the topology, but I, but I think we're concerned that it isn't discoverable or described effectively. So we'd really appreciate feedback there as well. Um, I think I have the incorrect link there, but it's issue 110. Um, and so the the kind of power systems data working group is really interested in like testing the, the draft spec that we have and uh, kind of seeing if it meets the needs of grid operators and will be effective to implement for everyone. Um, and so we're kind of looking to everyone to, to kind of review the spec and then join in and help change, make revisions and, and make it more effective. Um, so looking forward to having everyone involved. Alex, should I turn it back to you? Well, I can jump in. Um, so we've come to the end of the formal presentation and we do have quite a few questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and just go through these um, in the order received. The first one uh, came up during Hallie's presentation, so I believe maybe for you, and that is purchasing energy sounds like a wholesale contract activity. How do residents enter into contracts with their individual utilities? One of the, the benefits of the customer data working group that's being actively worked on as part of this uh, calendar sessions right now is understanding based on the rate that you're on or the tariff you're on, no matter what type of customer you may be, what is the underlying energy that is being supplied to you? So one thing that you might want to know as a residential customer or as a commercial or industrial customer is what is your consumption? But another part of it that you might want to understand is based on your rate or your tariff, what is the energy supply that is supplying that consumption. In other words, what is kind of the supply mix? And that might differ depending on what contract or tariff you're on. For example, if you're on a green tariff, the set of resources that is serving you or that has to be purchased by the utility or the energy supplier might be different than if you're just on the standard default tariff. So my that's my long-winded way of saying, uh, residents, you'd have to look at your individual utility or energy supplier, what are your options, but ideally you'd be able to see through the data that's provided in the specification what could be supplied uh, underneath that contract or tariff to you as any type of customer. Hopefully that answers it, but if there's a, another clarification, feel free to jump in. Perfect, thank you. The next question is for Alex. Um, since you stated the current standards organization is a slow review um, and agree on the standards process, how does submitting an LFE specification shorten that process to have the standard published? Sure, that's a great question. And Dan, maybe if you could go back to the slide that had the diagram of how the open standards process works. Should be towards the beginning there. 12, yeah. <clears throat> so I, I think the short answer is using an open standard doesn't actually short circuit the timeline to formal standard published. Uh, but what it does shorten is the timeline to actual utilization, iteration and public feedback on, on the specification, the open standard part of it. Um, Right. If, if you're thinking about the traditional standards process, all of that is done closed and internally. And so external stakeholders don't actually have a chance to understand and see 
what's happening there as it's progressing. And one of the challenges with that is it's basically putting a lot of pressure on that standard to be perfect when it's actually published. There, there's kind of slow feedback mechanisms to actually get that implemented in and iterated upon after the fact. So developing the standard in the open allows for earlier feedback mechanisms, ways to experiment with it, implement it, and ensure that it's actually tracking for the problem that needs to be solved. Fantastic. Um, I think the next two questions are related and they are likely for Daniel. So um, I'll pose these to you. Doesn't IETF already have standards for server metadata and client registration? And is the real connectivity issue defining standards or getting existing IETF standards adopted by the energy industry? So the answer to the first question is yes, they do. And our server metadata specification and our client registration specification actually extend those to add um, components that we believe are necessary in order to achieve adoption by the utility and other centralized entities um, community, um, specifically around um, coverage information as part of the server metadata, um, as well as for client registration, a, uh, a definition of registration requirements. So like what is needed in order to register. Uh, frequently you need to provide um, specific information about the entity that is trying to register with that utility. So for example, in Smart Meter Texas in Texas, uh, in order to register, you have to provide your DUNS number and stuff like that. And so we are basically defining how a utility can or a centralized entity can uh, disclose what sort of registration requirements there are so that there, the registration process can be automated and integrated into other platforms. For example, the goal is to allow something like a, for example, Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability integrate, automatically discover and integrate registration for other sort of system access or capabilities that utilities advertise without necessarily requiring their user base to go and do the potentially months long registration process back and forth, manual back and forth with each individual utility. So it's a way to automate that process. Another key component of the client registration um, specification is the communication um, protocols. Those are defined so that if a utility needs to communicate something like, hey, we want this information or you need to make a payment or you know, we're gonna be down for maintenance, that communication protocol is also defined so that platforms can integrate those deployments, those utility endpoints into their systems and their user bases can see and the platforms can manage those communications for that, for that individual user. So this is, you're completely right that those uh, server metadata and client registration are defined as part of the OAuth suite of specifications. Um, and these specifications basically take those and extend them um, to add the functionality that is needed in order for a utility to deploy it, a, a completely automated solution for connectivity establishment. Um, and so like the real connectivity issue is getting those standards adopted by a uh, uh, adopted by the utility industry. And so we see that our specifications as basically defining all of those kind of uh, edge missing pieces and in intricacies that would need to be defined in order for a utility to deploy something that is completely fully automated. One of the design principles we have in the working group is focused on, you know, assume a passive implementer. Um, and so a lot of the situations where we have seen utilities um, deploy connectivity, digital connectivity for customer data access, it has been under mandate by the regulatory authority that governs that utility. For example, in Ontario, Canada, data access was mandated as part of, uh, by the uh, OEB in Canada. And so we are actually um, uh, seeing that a lot of times a utility will be like, oh, 
I guess I'm just going to implement this thing. And there's not really a whole lot of uh, uh, resources put to making it actually useful. And so we include, or we have as one of our design principles that we need to include everything that will actually make this thing useful if it were deployed to strict specifications. And so that's like one of the goals here is moving beyond just the framework of an OAuth IETF system and into much more detailed specifications of how things must work for the registration, connectivity, disclosure, discovery, all of that sort of stuff, because frequently you have that. Um, then also, so I, I, does that answer the question, Stan? So it looks like there was a follow on, will the claim oh. registration process then be standard or will each utility be allowed to add additional elements or merely include their unique requirements in an element that is already defined in the client registration specification? So the, the latter. So we actually have a place where a individual utility that has unique requirements. So say you need the DUNS number, or you need some sort of agreement to a certain set of terms and conditions. Those are defined as part of the disclosure of when you go through the client registration. These are the extra fields that you need to submit as part of your client registration. Um, and then if there's any sort of like secondary steps, like a manual review process that is also disclosed, there's a place where you disclose that as part of the fields that you need to submit or that you need to be aware of when you register. And then secondarily, a communication protocol is defined for where those, that back and forth communication happens. So it doesn't happen over email, um, which is a very ad hoc status quo that we have now. Um, it happens in a defined manner as part of the protocol so that utilities who do have special requirements can automate those special requirements with the clients over the protocol so that integrations can integrate those special requirements. Perfect. Okay. Um, the next question is, will the proposed customer data format use, be usable by the EPA portfolio manager, which is heavily used in the US and Canada for building benchmarking? So the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, it can, it's an open standard. And so if the EPA wants to integrate that sort of connectivity into the portfolio manager system, um, that works as well. The data that you would get from the customer data standard um, is, you know, in just a set of data. It is not in the EPA's protocol format. They have a web services API that is bespoke to just the portfolio manager system. And so you would need to write a basically like a translator or an ETL uh, pipe between the two systems. But any number of vendors would be able to do that um, or potentially automate that as part of their platform. So um, for example, utility API is a platform that uh, that does that for other municipal rollouts of benchmarking data to integrate with the portfolio manager web services API. So uh, will, will it be usable? Absolutely. Um, it will probably require a translator, you know, uh, script, uh, but that's very achievable by, by any vendor who's familiar with the EPA's portfolio manager web services API. And it looks like you wanted to add on. And stuff. Oh, I was going to ask you, like, if I understand correctly, the customer yeah. data specification is intended to free up the data that is necessary to necessary for the EPA portfolio manager to work. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it's a way for, um, for example, an energy management company that is working with a building owner in order to get their data into portfolio manager to do their energy star scoring, that sort of thing. It's a way for that vendor to automate the process of collecting and getting that customer data so that then they can put it into the portfolio manager calculations. Fantastic. Uh, next up is carbon accounting, a wholesale or retail market activity. Since Tally's presentation indicated Google directly purchases renewable energy and most energy customers are serviced by utility and are not direct energy purchasers. 
I can take this one. It's both. From the perspective of Google, we might need to get wholesale data for our power purchase agreements, as you mentioned, and that's something that could use the same format that could be identified as part of this working group and specification. However, for carbon accounting, we also need to know our energy consumption, which is gonna come from our energy retailer. And that is gonna be similar for any type of commercial or other entity that needs to do carbon accounting or reports on carbon accounting. They will need to know their consumption data as well. And therefore uh, it, it's a both and. And so this specification serves for a customer use case that fits in either of those categories. Wonderful. Uh, next one, can non-engineers slash product folks join the working group? Speaking for our working group, absolutely. We have a mix of both engineers and other folks. And I think that's probably true of all the working groups because we want a, both a technical specification and one that's usable and has input from many different users. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we definitely would love uh, all, or all types of folks to join the working group. Um, one of the things that I wanted to also mention was that as part of a scope for these working groups, it's not only writing the technical parts of the specification, the specifications themselves, it is also creating content and demos and potentially uh, like open source uh, uh, tests around these specifications. And so like a summary overview, a presentation. These are all sorts of things that are within these working groups um, scopes. So we are gonna be writing a whole lot of stuff that is not technical, but is more educational or informative focused, as well as you know discussion around how these things work with various use cases. I think we also would really like help adopting these standards. So bringing them to utilities or grid operators and saying, hey, help us implement these standards so that we can actually access this data. Great. Next, uh, we have another question. Is the power system data spec something a grid operator will use or a customer use to understand the utilities capability and how the grid operates? I think it's primarily intended for customers because a lot of the grid data that utilities or grid operators have is locked down. So it's really a way of freeing up that data in a transparent, interoperable way around the world. So it's really to take the information that the grid operators have and make it available to customers. Okay. Um, the next one, um, it just says generation needs to split out zero carbon. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows how to respond to that. I think it's probably like if, if you look into the specification, there's a breakdown of generation by different types. So we we start like the high level category is included in the spec or there, but I think there's a it drills down quite deep into the different types of generation and reporting that is necessary. Um, then how can an organization or individual find out who has implemented the CDSC specifications? after they are adopted by ISO? So I can answer the first ones uh, for the first working group. So as part of the requirements of this, there is a well-known endpoint that must be published by a utility or a centralized entity and organization that is offering capabilities on this. And that was the discovery problem. And so, um, looking at that well-known endpoint is actually the uh, uh, a required part of implementing these specifications. And so you should be able to basically crawl utility websites and uh, other organizational websites to be able to discover what utilities are now offering these sort of capabilities. Obviously, other sort of avenues for discovery, so searching, you know, publications, announcements, PR, that sort of thing, regulatory um, engagements by utilities saying to the regulator, hey, we've done this. Um, those are the traditional ways of doing that, but the automated discovery is kind of the new addition for the specification. I would add from the perspective of uh, adoption, if there are any organizations that are interested in doing, let's call it a pilot version of implementation of these specs that are interested in working more closely with the groups to say, 
this is what it looks like in practice. These are maybe the challenges in practice. We are very interested in, in working with organizations on that as well to, to help provide more uh, proof points for, for this specification and understand what it looks like uh, in the, out in the real world in practice and, and how we can improve upon it and iterate over time. Yeah, I'll, I'll just emphasize that part. So, you know, we don't necessarily need to get approval by ISO before we can start implementing and adopting these specifications. And that's one of the concrete benefits of, of developing these as open standards. So, um, you know, just echoing Hallie, you know, experimentation, early iteration is, is great. So we look forward to collaborating with folks on that. Perfect. Next, regarding grid congestion at the distribution level and the need for real-time automatic monitoring of flows in the distribution grid, I didn't understand how Henry's presentation covered the topic. That's a good question. I think this spec is primarily focused on the transmission system, but it could be extended to the distribution system if, if there was value there. I think there's a lot of granularity that might be hard to accommodate. Um, but I believe there may be other projects at LF Energy focused on the distribution system and describing it better. Um, this is not my particular area of expertise, but we were focused on kind of entire system level description in the carbon data for uh, power system description. Um, Alex, when does a new working group need to move from a loose collaboration of members to a formal nonprofit entity with governance? Yeah, good question. You know, I, I, I think this is a little bit nuanced, so there isn't necessarily a one size fits all. You know, the community specification, I think, is a great place to start to just get going. And then there are times where either, you know, legal concerns by the various parties that are collaborating demand something that's more formal with, with a specific nonprofit entity to house the collaboration. Um, it could also be in terms of, hey, if you're looking towards whatever you're building is the, the specification graduating eventually to be a formal standard, the Joint Development Foundation, that nonprofit entity is a good middle step on that pathway there. So really the way I would think about it is community specification is a good place to start. Then there are times where, you know, triggers where either legal concerns or you need to fund the project that you're talking about, where you need a separate legal nonprofit entity. That's when you graduate to joint development foundation and then eventually the pathway to international standard. So hopefully that answers the question. Fantastic. And our last question, um, and if there are any more, we do still have some time, so feel free to add them uh, into the Q&A tool. But this last one is, if the, if the consumer does not directly purchase, then how do they know the cost of the energy for carbon accounting if they can only obtain consumption values? I believe this is a follow-up to one of the prior questions and my response. So I'll start here and then if anyone else wants to jump in or add, feel free. My one caveat is I'm not sure I understand fully the, the knowing the cost of energy portion, but perhaps something that could help answer this is going back to the one of the previous parts of the spec that I mentioned where from your utility, if the utility is able to provide a supply mix that aligns with the consumption that, uh, is uh, allocated to you as a customer, then for carbon accounting purposes, you should be able to also see what is the energy supply. In the absence of energy supply directly from the utility, this is where both working groups can come into play together. So if you only know your consumption values from your utility and you don't know what the generation side that should be used or the emissions that should be used for carbon accounting, you can also then in theory use what is on the grid or coming directly from the grid operator. And so if you have that data, which would be provided by a system operator who potentially implements the this working group, uh, power systems working group specification, then you can put those together to do your carbon accounting. So there are kind of multiple options here. The other thing that could be used and is also in draft as part of the customer data specification is the use of e EACs to understand 
if a utility is retiring EACs or energy attribute certificates on behalf of customers, one of the things that you might also want to know as a customer is, well, can I see those EACs that were retired on my behalf by the utility? And that can also be used from a carbon accounting perspective to say, okay, these are my clean energy EACs. So I know that this uh, matches this part of my consumption. And then for the rest, either using a residual mix, a utility supplier mix, or the average grid mix based on the hierarchy that the greenhouse gas protocol outlines. Wonderful. Well, that's all the questions that we had. So if there are nothing else, then um, I will thank all of our panelists once again and our attendees for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, this has been recorded and will be posted to the same page where you registered for this event, um, along with the slides. We will send an email around to everyone who registered when those are available, along with some additional resources. So thank you again, and we look forward to collaborating with all of you to further move the carbon data specification forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.